All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so we're just going to continue the lecture from where we left off last day. Um, so we're talking about networking. Um, so creating a multiplayer game where the players are connected via a network of some kind. Um, mostly we're not interested in players connected over a local area network. Uh, so if you're on a local area network or a LAN, most of the problems uh, that we're talking about here go away because uh, LAN communication over LAN is fast and generally reliable. Um, so normally we're talking about uh, applications that go over the internet. Uh, and so the problem is, is that when, you're, uh, when you have a multiplayer game that's taking place over the internet, uh, there it takes time for changes on one player's computer to propagate to the other player's computer. And so that's uh, propagation delay. Uh, so here's an example where um, uh, that illustrates a problem that you might run into um, caused by propagation delay. So you have uh, two players, so the player and the opponent. Uh, they are connected to a central server. The server here is determining what is actually happening um, in the world. So it holds the true game state. The player sees uh, the game state on their machine and the opponent sees the game state on their machine. Depending on how your game is set up, the game state here and here may not be synchronized perfectly. Um, so uh, suppose at time zero, your opponent casts a spell. Right? So I guess they cast a fireball spell in this example here. Um, and this fireball spell takes five seconds uh, to cast. So the opponent casts a spell on their computer. They send a message to the server indicating that at this time I cast this spell. Right? And the server says fine. Right? Five seconds later, the server knows that uh, the fireball spell will go off. Okay, now the player, at time three, they cast their silent spell. The silent spell casts instantaneously. Uh, so this spell presumably is going to cancel the opponent's fireball spell, thus causing the player to take no damage. So the problem here is though that at time three, on the player's computer, they cast their silent spell, but they now have to tell the server that they cast their silent spell. So that message gets sent to the server, but it takes some time to get to the server because uh, the player's network connection is slow. Right? And so this takes three seconds to reach the server. Uh, and so it doesn't reach to the server until time six. Right? Uh, and so by time six, the server thinks the opponent's fireball has already been cast because it takes five seconds to cast that spell. So at time five, the server says, hey, you're dead. Um, but the player thinks that they should have survived because they, in fact, did cancel the opponent's spell um, in time. Right, whoops. Right. And so the issue here, the issues that occur, uh, that occur here, um, there's a whole bunch of issues happening here. Right? So, uh, and there's a whole bunch of other problems that can occur here. So for example, when the opponent casts their fireball spell, uh, it might, it takes time to transmit that message to the server. Uh, that message might take a long time to send as well. Right? And so this issue might never, th the problem here might never occur, right? It takes a long time for the uh, server to indicate, for the opponent message that re to reach the server that they've cast their fireball spell. So the server thinks, oh, the fireball spell was cast at time four or something like that, right? The player's um, silent spell arrives at time six so that's fine, the server cancels the opponent's fireball spell, the player's fine, but now the, opponent's, uh, the opponent might be angry because the opponent might have thought, hey, my fireball spell should have gone off, what the heck happened? Right? And so you need, some sort of, uh, you need some sort of way to mitigate uh, the propagation delay. The server needs some way to resolve what is really happening in the world. Right? Okay, so, uh, so the latency over the network uh, causes all uh, causes is the root of all problems in network in these uh, network games. So, for example, if you have if you have uh, if there's high latency in the network connection, right, and your player does something like change their clothing, make attacks, runs away, does something, right, um, then a, 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 the other players could see something that is inconsistent with what has actually happened with the player. So a player changes their clothing and their, uh, your opponent or your friends continue to see the old clothing, uh, the old uh, appearance of the player uh, for several seconds thereafter. 
Now, the other issue that you have to deal with here is that, or sorry, one way that you can, uh, that the uh, client machines can deal with latency is that they can guess at what the, the other player is doing. So this is one of the approaches that you can take. And so if you're gonna guess that something is happening, whoops, sorry, right? If uh, your network latency is not very large, then uh, even if your guess is wrong, you can correct the error. Um, you're probably not wrong by very much and you can fix your guess. But if your network latency is very high, uh, then your guess is likely to be very inaccurate and any way that you fix the inaccuracy is probably going to be visually apparent uh, to the players in the room. Right? And so we're gonna talk shortly about dead reckoning. Um, this is one way that you can guess at where, um, uh, at where at the other players are in the world. Um, and there's other issues as well, right? So here, if uh, your, the player's client assumes that the player has successfully looted a dead enemy, right? Um, that adds that item to your inventory, right? But in fact, some other player reached that piece of, in, uh, looted the enemy first, right? And it's the other player that has the item in their inventory, right? Now you have to decide which player ends up with the item in their inventory. Do they both get it? Does the player get it or does the opponent get it, right? Or does neither get it, I suppose, would be another possible answer, uh, solution, right? Okay, so, uh, when state divergence occurs and is detected, the game has to do something to fix it, right? Um, the fixes are, can be very jarring um, in appearance, right? Um, and then to make the fix, well, making the fix also involves communication, communicating over the network. So again, the fixes now propagate, uh, 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 propagate to the other players over time but this takes some time to, uh, but the fixes take some time to propagate. Okay, so the amount of uh, latency that you have in your game directly affects your players, right? Uh, so there's this issue of state divergence. So to what degree does the players, uh, does the player's view of the world actually correspond to the true state of the world? Right? There's feedback um, issues, right? So uh, one way to deal with latency is to uh, not update the local view until you know that your message has been sent to the server, right? And so um, player does something and then sometime later the action actually occurs, right? Similarly, if a player does something, it now takes some time for other players in the world to see what has happened. So that's propagation delay, right? Animation delay is related to both of these as well, right? Uh, you might have to delay updating the uh, view of the player's world uh, depending on how much time it's taking to communicate information back and forth from the server, right? And then finally, when something goes wrong, uh, there is how do you fix the thing that's gone wrong, right? How often do you have to do this? Hopefully you don't have to do it very often, right? How do you do it? Um, one way to fix errors in position is to simply move players to their true position in the world, but that causes um, the game players to jump around in the world. So it causes things to warp around. Um, there's other solutions as well. Uh, they, none of them look great, to be honest. Okay, uh, this is just a quick slide uh, describing um, what you have to do if you're trying to run one of these, uh, if you're trying to run a very large online game. Uh, and so we don't talk about this much in this course. Um, this is really more of a network source issue, um, probably an advanced network source issue. So the, the uh, issue of what sort of infrastructure do you need to run one of these online games? And so if you're gonna run one of these large online games, so something like World of Warcraft, uh, where every server hosts, can host several thousand players, um, and there's probably several million players at any one time um, in the uh, World of Warcraft world. Uh, so um, if you're selling one of these games, uh, you want the players to be able to play your game whenever they want. So in other words, your game should always be available for them. Right, so what does this mean if you're running some sort of client server architecture? So if the company's owning the servers, right, they probably need to have lots of servers available. Uh, and the servers are probably fairly uh, beefy computers. Uh, so that gets expensive, right? They have to maintain lots of these servers. The servers always have to be running. Um, and um, uh, the servers themselves uh, are probably uh, very powerful computers. 
then there's this issue of scalability, right? So if your game is not very popular, unfortunately, right, you, you probably don't need so many servers, right? Uh, if your game suddenly becomes very popular, so what was the PUBG was one of the ones, more recent ones. Um, so that was a game that suddenly became very popular um, and the uh, makers of the game had to very quickly scale up the number of servers that they were using in order to accommodate all of these extra players that they weren't anticipating. You also have the opposite problem. So when players start to drop off out of your game, uh, you now want to get rid of servers uh, that you no longer need. Right? And of course, security is a big deal. Um, so depending on how your game is, uh, well, it doesn't matter how your game is built, uh, players will find a way to cheat. Right? The amount of cheating that you're willing to tolerate um, kind of affect is, does affect the quality of life of players in the game. Right? There are some games where cheating is, not is uh, notoriously common. Right? A lot of players complain about it. Right? They end up feeling that their game is unfair because other players have, a, have an advantage because they've got some sort of cheat enabled. Right? And so games go to um, sometimes very, very dramatic uh, degrees to, uh, uh, to prevent cheating. Okay, so most, uh, but, but, but most, well not most, many games uh, that run, uh, that are multiplayer over a network, use some sort of client server architecture. Um, so it's unusual to have a pure, uh, to have a peer to peer architecture. It's very hard to keep the state of the world consistent uh, in peer to peer. So typically there is a server somewhere, a centralized server, uh, and that server usually dictates the true state of the world. Right. So here's an example here where you have a client. So this is the player. Uh, there's the server here. Uh, the server here handles all of the, um, all of the data, all of the state data uh, that defines the true state of the world. Right. So where the true players of the, uh, true positions of the players are, right, the true state of all the players Right, locations of items in the world, so on and so on and so forth. Right, so the server has a model of the true world. Right. The clients, they all have a model of their, they all have a local model of the world. Right. Uh, and so in order to draw the, uh, or in order to render the game, the clients need to know what do they, the clients need to have some model of the world. Right. And so their model though, however, is not necessarily accurate. It's the, ser it's the server that has the true, uh, has the true, uh, that knows the true state of the world. So whatever private data can live on the client side, um, that's where the data lives. Um, and here the example is uh, the amount of ammo that the player has um, and the number of med kits that they have and so on and so on and so forth. Right. So the client, these are, these do, these, uh, the clients handle the presentation of the world Right, so they, uh, they're responsible for the rendering. Uh, the server handles the game logic, right? So the true state of the world. This is not uh, entirely true in today's world. Uh, so you can, um, so NVIDIA has a service where all the rendering actually happens on an NVIDIA server. Um, and uh, so you can actually play very, uh, games that are very highly video intensive um, on a very, very low end computer. So all of the rendering happens on NVIDIA's end and the image gets sent back to the client. Uh, so that, that lets people play uh, very high-end games on very low-end hardware. Oops, here we go. Right, so we've seen the client-server architecture before. Right, there's a centralized, uh, there is a central, oh sorry, the, the clients think there's one server. There could actually be a pool of servers, right, but conceptually there's one server. Right. The server holds the true state of the world. The clients uh, talk to the server um, to get updates about the true state of the world. Right. So when the client does something, they tell the server they've done something. Right. The server then communicates to other clients that something has happened with client number one. Right. Uh, and so there's this communication back and forth between the client and the server. So the game loop for a client server architecture um, is similar to the game loop for a single player game on a single computer, right? Uh, except you now have to deal with updates from the server. Right? So when the, when the user does something, right? Uh, typically, well, this, is, this, uh, this slide is not entirely accurate. So when the user does something, you, oh, sorry. 
you might choose to immediately update the local state. Right? So the user performs the movement immediately on the user's computer. They see the, mo they see the movement or the action. Right? And then you send a message to the server uh, describing what the user has done. Right? So whatever action the user has performed, you send that message to the server somehow. Right? Okay, so you also have to remember that uh, you have to now respond to information that comes back from the server. So you now check, are there any messages that have come back from the server? If there are, you read them and you process them. Right? So the server tells you, hey, player two has moved somewhere else. Right? And so now that's when you process uh, that piece of information and you update uh, the local state on the, on the client's computer to indicate that another player has moved somewhere in the world. Right? Then you do all of your regular stuff that you would normally do. Right? So any of the AI steps or the physics steps or whatever you now perform here. Right? Uh, and then you finally render your frame here. Right? So the first two steps, you're basically taking into account the fact that you have to send information to the server and then you have to respond to information coming back from the server. Right. Uh, so a simple little example here. Um, the server here is maintaining the true positions of player one and player two. Right. So I guess player one's at 1010, player two is at 123, 456. Right. The players, are the individual clients, they also hold their own local copy of the uh, world state. Right, or whatever state they need to actually render the world. Right? So they also hold uh, a uh, version of player one's position and a version of player two position. These are not, player two for client one is not necessarily accurate. Right? Player one is not necessarily accurate either depending on how the server is calculating where, peop, uh, where the players are in the world. Right? Player two, the idea is similar, right? They have uh, their own position, so P2. Right, and they also have what they think is the position of player one. Right, again, uh, the player one's position may not be accurate, uh, may not correspond to the true position of player one up here. Right. Uh, so because you've got a, uh, because you've got data here that is a, that is supposed to be a copy of the true data here, um, you end up with this consistency problem. Right, if this doesn't agree with the information stored at the server, uh, there's something inconsistent with the view of client, uh, of client two's world. Okay, here we have player one, they move to position 2020. Right. So they update their private data here. Right. So that 1010 becomes 2020, is this animated? It is, good, right? Okay, so now you've updated the local position here. You haven't rendered it yet, probably. Right. You're now gonna send that information to the server. Right. So the server, gets a message indicating that player one has moved to the new position 2020. Right, so the server updates its information there. Right. That player, the newly updated player one state is now shared with player two. Right. So player two now gets the message from the server that hey, player one has moved to 2020. Off we go. Right. If there's any other players in the world, right, they also get a copy of this message. Uh, so the problem is, in the time it takes, oops, sorry, here we go. So player one makes their move, right? And then in the time it takes to send the message to the server and for the server to send the message to all the other clients, right? That's steps two through four, right? As far as the other clients are concerned, their, their copy of player one is incorrect from the time periods, uh, steps two through four. And so you end up with a state divergence um, for player two, right? Player two still thinks that, here, they still think that player one's at 10-10, right? Um, even though player two, if player one has already moved, right? And so they don't know that player one has moved until they receive the message that player one has moved. All right, so your frame loop uh, in a game is typically very fast, right? So, uh, Typically your frame loop is running, well, as fast as you can normally uh, on a local, on the client's computer, right? Now the problem is, is that uh, you probably don't want to update the server uh, at the same rate at the, your frame loop is running at. Right? Uh, the problem is if you do this, you end up sending many, many messages over your network and you end up clogging uh, the network. Right? 
So how frequently are you going to send messages uh, to the network? Well, you could send them immediately, right? And so you run into this issue where you might saturate the network bandwidth. You might choose to send a message, instead of sending it immediately, you might choose to delay sending the message, right? So instead of sending it hundreds of times per second, you're gonna send it, say, five times per second, right? So every 200 milliseconds, you're going to update the server on a new position. Uh, so you end up with better network performance, right? You're sending fewer messages, uh, but now you've got this propagation delay, right? So instead of immediately sending the message, you're gonna wait two tenths of a, uh, 200 milliseconds, right? And now you've added to the propagation delay um, of the message. Right? Uh, so if your delay is too long, uh, the animation of the, typically what, what you end up seeing ends up looking very choppy. Right, you're gonna see this on your si on the last assignment. Right, uh, so on the last assignment, you're gonna there's a slider that lets you fiddle with the uh, propagation delay. Um, so you need to send messages all the time, or you can wait one up to one second to send a message. Right, you can imagine what's happening if you wait one second to send an update message. Right, the uh, the animation looks very choppy as because uh, you're updating the position of the other players in the world every once per second. Right, and that looks very choppy. Oh, here we go. Oh, so here we go. So you're updating the position every 200 milliseconds, right? But you're actually rendering um, much faster at a rate that's much faster than uh, once every 200 milliseconds. Right? Uh, and so uh, often, so sometimes this isn't so bad. 200 might be a little long. Um, it's not, often it's not so bad because in, there's many kinds of games where there's not really a whole lot of motion happening. Uh, and so if you wait 200 milliseconds, um, things don't look terrible, right? There's other ways to cheat this too. So you can create your game so that um, when you perform an action, uh, your, the avatar or the object uh, performs some little animation uh, that takes some amount of time before it actually performs the action. Right, so imagine you tell some player to move, or you're, you tell an NPC of some kind to move, and then say, okay, boss, or something like that, right? In the time it takes them to say that, say and perform their little animation, right, that 200, second, that 200 milliseconds may have already elapsed, right? And so by the time they start moving, right, your message has already arrived at the server, uh, and so everything looks fine. Okay. So the one way to deal with the fact that, sorry, where'd it go? Here. So one way to deal with the fact that you're sending updates uh, infrequently is that uh, you can guess, or your clients can guess, at where the position of the other players are instead of waiting for the server to tell them where the other players are. Right? And so there's this technique called uh, dead reckoning um, which you can use to uh, hide the fact that there is a latency uh, occurring. Right. So, so players send uh, their updated movement information periodically, but not as fast as it's actually happening. Right. So every 200 milliseconds, you might send the position, the velocity, and acceleration of your character. Right. Uh, in between those 200 milliseconds, right? Everybody, all the other players are simply guessing at where your, where your character actually is in the world, right? So they predict or extrapolate the position of all the other players between updates, right? When they get the actual update, they can then fix the true position, right? Or do something uh, to um, uh, correct the actual positioning, right? But in the meantime, you can sort of guess at where they're moving. How you guess it where, so how do you guess it where they're moving? Well, it's the exact same thing we've been doing throughout the entire course, right? So that's the player, right? So the uh, player is moving in this, they have this position, they're moving in this direction, right? Here's the enemy. The enemy wants to shoot at the player, right? If you know that the player is moving, you're not gonna aim directly at the player, right? You're gonna aim uh, in the path that, that the player is moving along. Right, so in other words, you're gonna try to guess where is the player going to be 
at the time it takes for my projectile to hit the, uh, to travel the distance between uh, my current position, um, whoops, sorry, and where I think the player will be. Right. Uh, Dr. Graham says it originally an AI technique. Uh, I don't think this is true, right? This has been around forever, basically, right? As long as we've been throwing things at things, this, uh, this idea <laughs> has been around, right? So I don't think this is really AI. Um, anyway, so in, a, uh, in one of these client-server games, right, while you're waiting for the, position, the true position of the other players to arrive, you can simply guess at where they're moving. Right? So at some point in time, you get an update of a, an object's position uh, and velocity. Right? You can simply assume that the object is going to move from this position at this velocity uh, with a constant velocity over time. Right? So you get, uh, so here you, uh, you know the position of, the, of M, right? Sometime later, you're gonna get updated about the true position of M, right? Anywhere in between, right? So in the, uh, so I guess one second later you get told, right? So in the increments in between, you can simply guess that M is moving, uh, where M will be, will be um, at any given time. Right? Of course, if M changes its direction, then your prediction's gonna be wrong, but that's fine, you're gonna correct that at the next time step. Right, so here, uh, we're gonna predict that M moves here, then here, then here, then here, then here, then here, because we're just gonna assume that they're moving in a straight line at constant velocity. Right, of course, if they turn some point, um, uh, if they turn at some point between here and here, uh, our guesses will be wrong, but we can fix our guess later on. Right. Not surprisingly, that equation shows up again. Right? How do you guess where the position of the player is going to be at some point in time? You just take their current position plus their velocity times how much time you want to predict them uh, into the future. Right? That's just the uh, Euler integration all over again. Okay, so um, you, can, uh, use this, uh, you can use this technique, and this is one of the techniques we're using, I think, on the next assignment. Um, how you predict or how you update the other player's position uh, changes depending on um, circumstances, right? So the, you might choose to provide different updates at different rates, right? So for example, if you have players that are very, very far from one player, right? You might not care so much about updating the player about their true position. So in other words, you might update uh, player. You might update the player about information of objects far away from them at a lower rate than uh, information about objects that are closer to them. Right? Depending on what activity the individual objects are performing, you might choose to uh, change the rate at which you're updating information. Right? If you have a very fast-moving object, it might be more important to update people of the position of that object more often than if you have a very slow moving object, right? Okay, so if you use dead reckoning, you will end up with some inconsistency, right? unless your time increments are very small, right? So when you use de dead reckoning, what happens is, so uh, on a local machine, when a player makes a move, they see their intended move immediately, right? Remotely, so every other player they see an extrapolated motion instead, right? And then they'll see the correction uh, when they actually get informed of the, player, of the other player's true position later on. Right. So we'll need some way to deal with this um, uh, inconsistency. All right, so that takes us to the next set of slides. So it's uh, slide set nine, networking number two. All right, so central to all of this is the idea of authority and consistency. Right? So authority is what determines the true world state, right? So someone, some, someone needs to keep track of what is really happening, right? So in a server-based game, it's the server typically that uh, keeps track of the true world state, right? And so the most common form of online games is one that uses a centralized authority, right? A server of some kind. Uh, Consistency means that the local state, so what a player sees, uh, must agree with what's really happening in the world. Right. So you want your games to be consistent, 
we know that they can't be, per uh, sorry, that's not true. We know that in many circumstances, they cannot be perfectly consistent. Right? The fact that there's uh, network latency means that it's uh, difficult to achieve uh, uh, true consistency all the time. Okay, so in a dedicated server, you end up with a client server-like architecture, right? The server acts as the central authority. The true world of the state is maintained by that server, right? And the server is responsible for updating the clients uh, with information about uh, the other, uh, uh, about the world state, right? Even though this is drawn to have one server, uh, in reality, on a large game, there's probably a network of servers uh, that are actually, uh, th that, are, um, that are here. So if there's a central, uh, if there is a central server, it's the game company that's probably paying for that central server, right? Many other games do not use a centralized server owned by the uh, game company. Uh, so a lot of games work with what's called an ad hoc server. So an ad hoc server is simply one of the clients ends up acting as the server, right? So one of the players' computers ends up acting as the server computer. And so here, this is one of the five players, right? So they, they are also themselves a client, right? Their computer now acts as the centralized, uh, now becomes the authority, right? So that's, this computer now holds the true world state, right? All the other players in the world uh, are relying on this uh, ad hoc server or this client uh, to communicate information about the true world state to them. Uh, if you're unlucky, so if the player that gets chosen to be the ad hoc server has a really crappy network connection, right, uh, the performance, the network uh, performance here is probably very poor. Right. Um, many games work this way uh, because there is uh, the, uh, the, the, either it's impractical to run a centralized server um, uh, or this is the only way that you can get the performance that you want out of a particular game. Uh, so one of the common game, one of the one popular game that uses this model is um, all of the FromSoft games. So all of the Dark Souls games and Elden Ring, and all of the other multiplayer FromSoft games all work this way. One of the players gets chosen. Uh, so in uh, games like Elden Ring and Dark Souls, you can invade another player's world. When you invade the other player's world, that other player that you're invading, they become the ad hoc server. Okay, so here's this example again of uh, what happens when you have a centralized server. So when you have a centralized authority, it's the centralized authority uh, that keeps track of the true state of the world. Okay, so we saw a, an example of a prediction algorithm earlier. Right? So dead reckoning is one way that you can uh, deal with latency, right? You can predict the location of other entities in the world. Right. There are other ways to solve the consistency problem, right? So there's this thing called dead in, uh, delayed input, time offsetting, and there's other algorithms as well, right? So there's, uh, so uh, one of the things you're worried, of, one of the things you are concerned about when you're creating an, uh, a multiplayer network game is the consistency, but there's other things you have to think about, right? Uh, there is, how do you fix errors in the game, right? So for example, if you have a prediction algorithm of some kind, the predictions are going to be wrong. At some point, you have to correct the predictions, right? How do you fix them, right? So you can just fix them immediately. So if you predicted the wrong position of something, you just move the object to its true position, right? You can try, instead of moving it to its true posi position, you can gradually move it to its true position. So you can do a smooth correction, right? Uh, you can simply ignore the fact that there's a problem, right? So maybe you don't really care that the other players don't know the true position of the other players in the world. Right. This is an interesting one here. We'll, we'll take a look at an example of that uh, either today or at the in the next lecture. Right. And then finally, there's another axis, uh, there's another dimension that you have to consider, right? There's all these decision-making um, uh, problems that you have to deal with, right? So eventually you, someone has to decide what is the true state of the world, right? So if you're running this, um, uh, so the server has to decide, I've got all this conflicting information coming in from these clients. It has to resolve uh, all this information and decide, okay, so what's really happening in the world, right? The clients also have an issue, right? The clients, uh, each individual client 
might think that the world looks one way, right? But eventually the server tells them, hey, things are actually different. So now the clients have to deal with uh, um, this inconsistency in the world as well. Okay, so let's look at some of these consistency algorithms today. Why is this animated? Okay, so prediction, uh, so we saw an example of this already, right? So dead reckoning is a prediction algorithm. I don't, I don't know how, I, I don't know the true position of the other players in the world, but I can guess at them. Right? So this is an example of what's called optimistic consistency. Right? Uh, it's optimistic, so when a player moves, on their computer they move immediately. Right? You're going to address any issues later on. Right? So on the local, local actions occur immediately, those, uh, that information gets propagated out into the world. Right, at some slower rate than it's actually happening on the uh, client's computer. Right? So the other clients are gonna guess at what's happening. Right? Later on, we can try to fix those errors. Right? So we can then do the error correction after the fact. Right? Dead reckoning is one of these types of predictive algorithms. Right? Uh, if your predictions are correct, uh, then this actually works, or reasonably correct, um, then this works pretty well. Uh, so if your game involves things that are moving more or less at a mm, regular speed, um, this, is probably, uh, this is probably not a bad way to do things. Right? Of course, eventually, uh, if your delays are very long in how much time it takes for the server to update the other clients of what's going on, right, you end up having to fix the problems. Right? And so now you have to also deal with the error correction. Uh, so you want to, you might consider using a predictive algorithm when your predictions are probably more or less accurate, right? And when you don't really care if there's some sort of state divergence. Now, if you actually do care uh, about, um, uh, if you do, uh, sorry, if you, if you actually do care that everybody always has the true state of the world, uh, you can't use a prediction algorithm. You have to use something else. So the other form of consistency is what's called pessimistic consistency. Right? So in pessimistic consistency, you want to make sure that all players have the same view of the world. Right? Some games, this is important. Right? Uh, so in many real-time strategy games, so something like StarCraft, it's pretty important that every player has the same view of the world. Um, okay, so the way this works, uh, so one way that you can make this work is with an algorithm called delayed input. So here's player one, they're gonna do something, right? So they perform some action. Um, in optimistic consistency, right? As soon as the player does something, some action occurs on the player's computer, right? So they see their player move. In pessimistic consistency, you don't want the player to see something happen until all the other players agree that something has happened, right? So some input occurs, right? And now you wait. So you wait some amount of time, for example, 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, hopefully not one second, right? And only after that amount of time has applied, uh, has, has occurred, do you actually, uh, does the client actually update player one's position, right? So this is what player one is seeing, right? They do something here, sometime later, their action appears on their screen, right? This time here is spent sending information to the server and then having the server communicate that information back to the other players, right? And so hopefully this delay is long enough for the player one's client to update the server and for the server to update all the other clients, right? If that delay is chosen with an appropriate time, right? Player two can then update uh, their world time at the same time that player one updates, uh, that player one's client updates their world view. Now for this to work, player one and player two need to agree on time, right? So you need a global clock here as well. The server also needs a global clock. So you need to synchronize time on all, three on all of the computers. This turns out to be a very hard problem. Um, it's more or less unsolved. So it's one of the unsolved networking problems. How do you coordinate time across multiple computers? Right? Uh, there are algorithms that work pretty well. Um, I don't think any of them are guaranteed to work in all cases. 
Okay, so what's nice about this? Well, what's nice about this is that everybody always has the same view of the world, right? The server has the same view of the world. All the clients have the same view of the world. There is no inconsistency. Uh, so that's nice. What's bad about this? Well, player one does something and then some amount of time happens before they see the change, right? And so uh, there's this lag on the uh, local client. And so there's this, uh, there's this feedback lag. Uh, so a doctorgram says delays of up to 100 milliseconds are often not noticeable. Uh, that's probably true for a casual player, right? So for casual players, you can probably afford to wait some fairly large fraction of a second. Um, if you're playing, if it's a professional player playing some sort of shooter game, that's an eternity, right? Uh, if you had a 100 millisecond lag on like Call of Duty or something like that, no one would play your game. So this sort of, this technique doesn't work for all sorts of games. For real-time strategy games, you can often make this work, right? You can mask the delay with some sort of animation like I mentioned before. Right. Is that time accurate? Sorry, I just, okay. Okay, so that delay that you're gonna pick, you have to pick that time, right? So you have to pick that time carefully. Um, you wanna balance the impact on feedback, right? So you don't want it to be too long. Right? But you still need all your network messages to propagate out, right? Because if uh, this update fails to arrive at player two in time, player two is gonna have an inconsistent view of the world, right? So you now you need some technique to deal with, well, what happens if the message arrives late or doesn't arrive at all? Because network communication is not guaranteed, uh, is not guaranteed to be lossless, right? So here, player one processes their input after a given delay Right. In this example here, it takes uh, the message uh, doesn't arrive at player two until they were supposed to process the input already. Right. So this is where they were supposed to process the input. They don't have any message from player one. Right. The, pro the input doesn't get processed until here. So what do you do here? Right. So at this point here, you have to do something. Right. So maybe you have to guess at what player one did or something like that. Or you have to live with the fact that uh, you're going to update late. Okay, uh, so there are some older games that use this technique, right? So Age of Empires apparently used this technique. Uh, any games that happen uh, where the pace of action is very fast, uh, this is not a good choice, right? Racing games, uh, first person shooter games, things like that, uh, you're not going to use um, this kind of technique. Right, or probably any other of the um, pessimistic uh, consistency techniques. Right. So another pessimistic uh, consistency, consistency technique is called uh, lockstep synchronization. Uh, and so here, uh, players uh, send turn actions and they wait for a response before they apply the action. Right, so here you're not waiting some fixed period of time, you're waiting for enough time so that you get a response from the other player, probably the servers, right, from the other, um, from the server. So in this example here, the blue line shows you, uh, this is when player one does something, right? So they perform some action at this time here. Right? Player two performs their action sometime later, right? So when player one action reaches player two, probably via a server of some kind, right? At this point, players two computer now Syn synchronizes their world state, right? And then renders uh, their, uh, and then displays the view of what's happened in the world, right? So they're waiting for all the information from all the other players in the world to arrive, whoa, sorry, right? Before they do something. Similarly with player one, right? So player one is gonna wait until they hear from player two that something has happened, right? So they hear from player two that something has happened here, right? They now take their action that they applied at this time step, right? And now it gets, um, fed into the player one's world. Right. So player one now takes an action at this time, right? They send their message out into the world, right? Eventually it reaches player two, right? Player two takes their action here, right? So player two now, once it rece receives player one's message, now player two's client can update. Right. Up here, player two has sent a message and it takes a long time to get to player one. So player one doesn't update their, uh, their client doesn't update for some long period of time, right? 
if uh, no new action has been taken, so your, the clients only ever update when they receive a message from the other um, player, right, or from the other clients, right? So if there's no new action being taken, then you periodically send out, a uh, each client periodically sends out a response indicating that no action has been taken, right? That lets all the other clients update, right? Even if you're not doing anything, right? Even if you're just standing around. Uh, and so that's lockstep synchronization. Right, so here the issues are um, instead of having, so in delayed input, you have a regular lag between when your input happens and when the input gets processed. Right, lockstep synchronization, you can have variable lag. Right? Uh, if your network connection is, uh, if your network connection is fast, this isn't an issue. If your network connection is poor, uh, this variable lag can be very long, right? Uh, and then there's bucket synchronization. Uh, so in bucket synchronization, you make regular updates. So your turns occur over a fixed amount of time. So this is similar to the delayed lag, right? So roughly every 200 milliseconds uh, is considered the length of a turn, right? You can, of course, change that amount of time, right? All player moves are stored until they're processed, right? Once you process them, you get rid of them, right? But whenever a player makes a move, that move is not executed until the end of the next turn. So here's player one. So the blue lines are showing you the uh, start and end of each turn. Right? So player one, they make a move sometime between in this time period here. Player two also makes a move sometime in this period here. Right? So they make their move. This move isn't processed until the end of the next uh, turn. So the end of the next turn is here. Right? So whatever move they made here gets processed on player one's computer, uh, sorry, player one's computer here. Whatever player two made in this time gets processed here, right? So now you're getting regular updates of the world. In this time period here, player one has made, performed some action at this point here. And so they send out their update message to the server, the server sends it out to the other players, and it arrives at player two over here, right? Player two does something similar, right? In this time period here, they make a move, right? That arrives at player one's computer sometime later, right? So this move here and this move here, they get updated at the end of the next time step, right? So player one move gets updated here. Players two move gets updated here, right? The information that player two sent showed up in this time slot, so it gets updated at the end of this turn as well. On player's two side, they made their move up here, so that it gets updated at the end of this time slot here, right? They received player one's message in this time slot here, so that also gets updated at the end of this uh, time slot. Right? In this time slot here, player one makes a move, sends out their um, message. Player two has decided to make two moves, right? So you can have multiple moves occurring in a time slot the multiple moves can end up arriving in the wrong order, right? So here, the move that happened here arrives after the move that happened here, but that's okay because you're gonna synchronize everything at the end of the time step anyway, right? And so these two moves here, they both get processed at the end of this time slot, right? Player's one, player one's move, which was here, gets processed down here, right? Uh, so uh, in this particular, in this, um, in both bucket synchronization and in lockstep synchronization, uh, you also have to deal with the fact that, uh, you have to deal with the problem of what happens when a message fails to arrive, right? Uh, so here, remember in lockstep, lockstep synchronization, players two client doesn't update until they receive a message from player one, right? If this message gets lost some, for some reason, players two client never updates. Right, so you have to decide on what you're gonna do uh, if, you, if a long amount of time has elapsed and you haven't received a message from the other client. Right? Similarly here, you have to decide what are you going to do if a message gets lost. Right? Uh, so if this movement from player one gets lost, right, uh, it won't get updated at the next time step. Right? Um, do you resend the message? Right? How do you resend the message? Uh, and so on and so on and so forth, right? So there's, there are issues that you have to deal with um, in these algorithms as well. 
Okay, so there's one more pessimistic uh, strategy, that, a couple more pessimistic strategies that we can talk about, but we're out of time for today, uh, and so we'll continue the discussion in the next lecture.